Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Timothy Sandifer. He's principal attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation and heads the foundation's Economic Liberty Project. He's the author of, among many books, The Right to Earn a Living, published by the Cato Institute. Is there a right to earn a living? I mean we look at the, the constitution and it mentions various rights that we're all familiar with, free speech and religion and so on and so forth. But we don't see the right to earn a living mentioned anywhere in it. That's true. But the constitution protects the right to liberty. Uh, and liberty, of course, is a very broad concept. It includes all sorts of freedoms and among other things, it, it includes the right to use your skills in providing for yourself and for your family and, and to earn, earning a living, of course, is one of the rights that under the American and, and English common law traditions has been protected for centuries. Um, the founding fathers were very familiar with legal precedents from British history that protected the right to earn a living and um, of course another phrase in the constitution, the privileges and immunities clause of both the, the constitution itself and of the 14th Amendment. Uh, preserve the freedom to earn a living. So yes, the right to earn a living is not just a constitutional right, but uh, Justice William Douglas once called it the most precious liberty that man possesses. Well, this clearly doesn't mean that I can sell drugs or prostitution. It, it's, it's not really describing that. It, it's not an absolute right. It just means that you have some protection from government encroaching on some things, but not everything. Is there? Well, I would dispute that it doesn't protect your right to sell drugs, but it protects your right. Uh, traditionally, the right to earn a living has been pr held to protect your right to trade fairly for others uh, consensually for what they're willing to pay you in exchange for what you're willing to sell, subject to regulations that are designed to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And so you can't sell adulterated products uh, with a fraudulent label, for example, or you can't sell dangerous products without warning people of it. You can't sell stolen items, things like that. But um, it does mean that you have the right to trade your labor um, to an employer or to make products and sell the fruits of your labor and keep the, the earnings that you make without unreasonable interference from the state. Um, this right – in my book, I go back in the common law history to, to really Shakespeare's day. The, the 17th century was really the time when this right really came to be articulated most explicitly in the um, English common law system. And what the, what the common law judges, particularly Lord Edward Cook, the, who became Chief Justice under King James I, um, what Lord Cook and his, his colleagues were articulating was the right to be free from royal monopolies. Um, or from the interference of trade guilds that wouldn't allow you to practice a business without permission from that guild. So for example, my, one of my favorite cases is the case of the upholsterers in which the a, a man tried to practice a trade of upholstery without having the permission of the upholstery guild and he was brought up on charges for it and uh, Lord Cook was presiding as chief justice at that time and he, of course he, he says to the, to the guild, well, what, what, why do you have to have a license to practice upholstery? And of course the, the guild doesn't say the real answer, which is we want to restrict the trade of upholstery so as to raise our prices and, and, and extract more money from consumers who have fewer choices. No, of course, what they said was, well, it protects the public. From what, right? From bad upholstery. <laughs> and so Lord Cook said, no skill there is in this for a man might learn it in seven hours. <laughs> and then in one of my favorite lines from any court opinion, he said, unskillfulness is sufficient punishment. If you're bad at your job, that's that's punishment enough. There's no reason for the government to get involved. And th that opinion and many like it were the foundation of the anti-monopoly tradition of the 17th century that the founding fathers were familiar with. They grew up as law students reading the law, studying for the bar, people like Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall. And they read Lord Cook's books about the law and they learned about this tradition of uh, the anti-monopoly tradition which rested on the right of every British subject to earn a living without unreasonable government interference. But OK. But all of us – in this room are, are earning a living and most of the people that we know are earning a living and the people who are not earning a living, if we look at why, it's because they're, they're having trouble finding work. It's not – we don't see the government saying, no, you're not allowed to get a job. So how is this right being violated today if it is being violated? In fact, there are a great many people who can't get a job because the government says they're not allowed to and then particularly um, this is done through occupational licensing and other kinds of licensing requirements. So for example, um, you aren't allowed to not just you – know, people think 
lawyers, doctors, that sort of thing. That's what they think of when they think occupational licensing. But in fact, something like two-thirds of the American workforce now needs the government's permission before they're allowed to practice their jobs. Everything from uh, hairstylists to nail salons to pest control workers and some of them are truly absurd like the Louisiana law that requires you to have a license to practice the trade of being a florist, for example, well, which requires – Well, protect people from really bad flower From ugly flower yeah, arrangements. Absolutely, yes. I, We're not kidding. That really is the law. The law says – it said – it was recently amended, although it's still on the books. But at the time that this case occurred in 2005, the law said you, in order to get a, a license as a florist, you had to pass a test where you were graded on the beauty of your floral design. So it really was a law to prevent you from selling ugly floral arrangements. To protect the public? I mean that, that's crazy. And yet because courts have for the past half century or more turned their backs on the importance of economic liberty as a constitutional right, those kinds of laws do bar a great many people from earning a living and they do so in a number of ways. It's not just that people don't have the required training or experience. It's also to pass the test, you have to pay a fee to take the test. The tests are sometimes administered only once a year or they're administered in inconvenient places. So if you're going to take the test to be a florist, you have to drive to the city where they're, hold, where they're administering the exam and you have to stay overnight in a hotel. Now, you know, you and I can afford that sort of thing, but the kind of person who's looking for an entry level job as a florist, that's a significant chunk of change, you know. Plus, even worse, there are laws in the books to prohibit people who have been convicted of crimes from obtaining occupational licenses, even when those crimes have nothing whatsoever to do with the business at hand. If you've been convicted of any felony, you are barred from businesses like in some states. You're barred from running the, uh, a moving company or working for a moving company if you have been convicted of any felony, even if the felony was, I don't know, carrying a gun in a place you're not supposed or something like that. That has nothing to do with moving. Well, these entry-level jobs are the place where people with criminal records can go to have a second chance in life. And so we're, we're pulling up the ladder for the people at the bottom rungs. So yes, I think the government does often bar people from, from economic freedom. Uh, you mentioned that this is – we already talked about you for 100 years or so. You mentioned that they've been ignoring it. Let's go back, let's go back a little bit to the founding era. Uh, was it the case that – so we had cases like Dr. Bonham's case and things like this in the 17th century. But was it the case that there were right to earn a living cases – being adjudicated in the 1820s, for example, were people suing about this? In the 1820s, you started seeing them, yeah. But before then, so, so the period of colonial history, there aren't a lot of cases that I've found on the subject. And that's a couple of reasons why. One was there was no guild system in the United States, there, in, the, in the American colonies, where there was in England. And so these issues didn't arise very much. Secondly, the, these disputes during the revolutionary era, restrictions on economic liberty, liberty did play a, a central role. So for example, Thomas Jefferson's summary review of the rights of British America, which was the pamphlet he published that got him the job of writing the Declaration of Independence. In the summary view, he complains among other things about – English laws that prohibited the colonists from, send, from manufacturing retail items out of iron. The law said that the colonists could mine iron and, and then had to send it to Britain to be made into items for sale on the retail market. And he says in, in, in the summer review, he says this, is, this law is intended to support not men but machines in the island of Great Britain. And what he means by that is this law isn't to protect the public. This law exists to protect the, the jobs of those uh, iron workers in Great Britain who didn't want to compete economically, didn't want to compete fairly against workers in the, in the colonies. So yes, these issues were around at the time and you f the, the first very – really famous case on the issue of, of economic liberty of course is Courtfield versus Coriel, the decision – by Justice Washington, which I believe was at 1829? 1828, I think. Yeah. 18, yeah. And, and that was a question – the case is actually only tangentially touches on the right to earn a living, but he goes it off – It has to into, do with fishing rights. It, yeah, it was sort, uh, harvesting yeah. oysters. Harvesting oysters. That's and the question was whether, you, whether a person in one state had a right to harvest oysters in another state. Mm -hmm. And this was Bushrod Washington who was George Washington's grandnephew. Yeah, that's right. And was a justice on the Supreme Court, but he was writing – circuit. So he was serving at a lower level at yeah, this point. Yeah, as a trial judge. Yeah. And, and he says – actually, he ruled against the plaintiffs. He said you don't have that right to, to, sh to fish in other waters. But, um, but he said – in a very famous passage in that opinion, he says what rights are protected by the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution? It includes the rights, among other things, to economic 
uh, freedom. And of course, the reason he bas he said that was because the Articles of Confederation had also included a privileges and immunities clause, which was in turn based on the Magna Carta's protection of the right of tradesmen to cross boundaries. So you see, this this right of economic liberty is a traditional right that was time and time again asserted when constitutions and bills of rights were written. And and then we get up to the Civil War and the passing of the Fourteenth Amendment, which often remind people that. Slavery is many things, but one of the things it is is a systematic denying of your right to earn a living. And, exactly. And, I mean, with other things to it, but that's a big part of it. And they try to fix slavery with the Fourteenth Amendment and another privileges or or immunities clause. So you talk you know, a little bit about what happened in the eighteen late eighteen sixties. Yeah. Moment. Well, nobody has more beautifully put this point than Frederick Douglass, himself an escaped slave, who in his memoirs writes about this beautiful passage. Just. Amazing where he talks about after he escaped from slavery into Rochester, New York and he was looking for a job and he was looking for a job. He was walking down the street and he saw a bunch of coal that had been delivered by the coal delivery company and back in those days, you would get coal delivered to you and they would just shovel it out on the sidewalk and you had to then put it into your basement somehow and so people would get jobs shoveling the coal down the coal chute into your basement. So he saw this pile of coal and he knocked on the door and he asked the lady inside if he could you know, sh shovel the cold into her basement, and she said yes, and he did it. And he says in his memoirs, he said, "To understand the feeling which which clutched my heart when I held the the two silver half dollars, realizing that it was mine, that my hands were my own, and could earn more of the precious coin, one must have been in some sense himself a slave." And I that reason I love that passage so much is it really articulates the the deep connection between economic liberty and personal autonomy, the sense of freedom that that he was trying to express came in the form of having earned money to provide for his own food, for his own shelter. And it was to protect that right that the Fourteenth Amendment's privileges or immunities clause was added. And I, I always want to emphasize this. The Fourteenth Amendment is one of the great achievements in human liberty. It's unfortunate that in recent years we've heard a large number of people complaining about the 14th Amendment and saying that it was somehow an infringement on states' rights and so forth. The 14th Amendment was a great accomplishment in freedom and one reason why is because it protects you against the power of your own state, which had not been done before and among the rights that it was intended to protect was the right to earn a living. And that's uh, I always – Expressly referred to in the, in the debates around writing and ratifying that Absolutely. amendment. Absolutely. Before the 14th Amendment, there was no floor to the states. There, right? the, 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 it established a floor below yeah. that they didn't have, give themselves. They could have had their own bill of rights but there was no floor that they couldn't go below. But what happens in the slaughterhouse cases? Well, that, of course, the slaughterhouse case was the first opinion from the Supreme Court interpreting the 14th Amendment. Amendment, 1873, and the court was asked to review a Louisiana statute that re established a monopoly in the butchering trade. Um, it said that if you wanted to slaughter cattle in New Orleans Parish, you had to do it at a single privately owned slaughterhouse that just happened to be owned by members of the Louisiana State Legislature. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> And, um, it's, it's always Louisiana. They're, oh, they're nuts down there. Not much has changed. Yeah. <laughs> they also have the highest prison population. So it's just it's <laughs> all, all those all unlicensed place. butchers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, um, of course, this law. I, I, an analogy would be if the state of California were to pass a law that said all automobiles in Los Angeles County have to be repaired at the Amco on Vine Street, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so it put hundreds of butchers out of business overnight. They filed suit saying, "Yeah, there's a ton of cases. I mean, they're, they're 125, I think, put uh, together. Yeah, that's why by it's the time. slaughterhouse cases. Yeah." yeah the entire list of them is huge. And it got up to the Supreme Court and the question was, we have a right protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment to earn a living without interference by unreasonable government monopolies. That right had been protected for at that time 275 years and this state law establishes such a monopoly. It therefore violates the 14th Amendment. It's a pretty clear logical argument and the Supreme Court said no. And the reason behind that was the Supreme Court said they could not imagine – that the Fourteenth Amendment was really intended to have the federal government protect civil rights against states. Therefore, that can't be the right interpretation of the Fourteenth Amendment. End of story. That was really what Slaughterhouse says. It's an amazing opinion to they read. They could have just gone and asked them. Like, yeah. They could have just gone to Bingham and asked him, right? It was there's five no, years ago they had passed it. That's right. There, and there's no reference in the opinion to the debates about the Fourteenth Amendment. Anyway, um, unfortunately, that case remains on the books today and so the Privileges or Immunities Clause has essentially never been enforced. Uh, out of curiosity, are you still limited in where you can slaughter cattle? Uh, in Louisiana? <laughs> well, probably. But I, there is actually an interesting footnote to that. There were, about five years later, Louisiana held a constitutional convention and as part of that convention, they eliminated 
the Louisiana slaughterhouse monopoly. And so the owners of the slaughterhouse monopoly sued the state of Louisiana saying they were being deprived of their right to the monopoly that they had been given. <laughs> and that went to the Supreme Court and my hero, Justice Stephen Field, the first Californian on the US Supreme Court who wrote the lead dissent in the slaughterhouse cases took the opportunity of that case, which is called Butcher's Union versus Crescent City Livestock Landing and Slaughterhouse Company. He took the, the opportunity of that opinion to rail on again about how the slaughterhouse cases had been wrongly decided. So no, actually, that butcher monopoly was repealed shortly thereafter. But unfortunately, it didn't overturn the legal precedent. And after that, so now the Privileges or Immunities Clause is kind of a dead letter. It gives you, some, it gives you some important rights though, yeah. uh, such as the right to navigate well, in, in federal here's, waters. And, yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> there, here's an interesting thing about it. I think, I think that most of the legal world is a little confused about the slaughterhouse cases. The slaughterhouse case has been overruled. It's just nobody realizes it Slowly. yet. Slowly. It, no, it already has been. Yeah, you're right. Slowly. Oh, gradually, it was overruled and people haven't realized it because what has happened was the slaughterhouse court did not deny that the right to earn a living is a constitutional right. They admitted that. What they said was it's uh, that federally protected civil rights are a very limited number of rights such as the right to travel on the high seas mm -hmm. and that the – that federal civil rights had not been – I mean that, that civil rights had not been entrusted to the federal government for protection. Well, the Supreme Court has, has said otherwise not just with regard to – equality rights or voting rights. The federal Supreme Court has over and over again said that economic liberty is a right that the federal courts will protect against state interference. They say that to this day. So that part of Slaughterhouse, which is really the important part, has actually been abrogated and it seems like nobody has realized it yet. I don't understand why. Well, I think that they just sort of bemoan the fact that it's it, it could have been easier than doing it piecemeal with the due yeah. process clause over the course of, of many years. Yeah. So we're, but the Slaughterhouse were in 1873. Um, and then we get to working on creating this floor again for the states via the due process clause, which was not really the best way of doing it. But then now, we get to Lochner. Yeah. Now, I, I, briefly, I, I'll say a lot of people say that, that the due process clause was used as a substitute for the privileges or immunities clause in the years that followed. And I disagree with that. I think that first of all, the first substantive due process case was Loan Association versus Topeka, which was in 1874. So it was only a year after Slaughterhouse. You wouldn't say that Dred Scott was a substantive due process? No, well, it, only in the sense that substantive due process is an inherent part of almost every judicial review case and that substantive due process has been around since – the Magna Carta in 1215. So the due process clause protects your right to be free from arbitrary deprivations of liberty, whether it's a procedural deprivation or a substantive deprivation. The idea of separating substantive and procedural due process is incorrect. They are the same thing. And what the courts did was – it's true. They stopped enforcing the privileges or immunities clause and they laid more emphasis on due process. That's not – that wasn't a, a replacement. It's just that after Slaughterhouse, they were left with nothing other than the Due Process Clause and they correctly enforced the Due Process Clause in cases like a loan association. That's a little bit technical though. Um, with, on, what happened then was between the 1870s and 1900, the court started protecting more and more the right to freedom of contract against state interference. A lot of people say, well, gosh, the Supreme Court got so activist in those years. Well, that's because this 14th Amendment had just been added. So only now were the federal courts in the job of protecting people against their states. Anyway, in Lochner, it, that was a case in 1905 in which the Supreme Court said that the state of New York could not prohibit people from working 10 hours a day in a bakery if they so chose. And the, the state had passed a law that said you weren't allowed to work 10 hours a day and the um, – this man named uh, Amon Schmitter. He was a, a German immigrant who worked in a bakery in Utica, New York. He went to his boss, Joseph Lochner, and he said, I'd like to work more than 10 hours a day. And Mr. Lochner said, I'd like to pay you to work more than 10 hours a day. And so they shook their hands and there you go, right? That's it. Two grown adults who have the right to do with their own bodies what they please and it ain't nobody else's business if they do. And yet they were brought up on charges for this. Well, they also intended to break the law. Of course. Yes. I mean, and, and then went to say, that's right. go report me. Let's, let's bring this. Became Lochner, a test Lochner case. was a was a – Definitely a – he seemed like an interesting guy because he had right. been a sort of a bug to the uh, an annoyance to the lab, to the unionized butchers for yeah, a while. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting for bakers, case. For one, for one thing, the lawyer who argued against the constitutionality of the, of the bake shop law was a guy who had previously been a union activist who had been the leading proponent of the bake shop law. <laughs> anyway, um, in the Lochner 
case, the Supreme Court said no. People have the right to earn a living without unreasonable interference. The government can restrict that economic freedom in order to protect the public. But there's no reason to believe that working more than 10 hours a day in a bakery is bad for the public or bad for bakers or bad for bread or anything like that. It really is just a meddlesome interference in a person's right to decide what kind of job to take, what kind of hours to work, what kind of wages to earn. And if the government's going to restrict that, then it can get it involved in every aspect of our economic freedom and that's intolerable. Therefore, you know, denied, it's and, kind which is exactly like, right. It's kind of like uh, when you mentioned the upholsterer's case because there's another exactly. line in that opinion where he kind of says, well, this is just baking bread. Right? As he said, yeah. it takes seven hours right. to learn. This is just baking bread because they had, they had dealt with minors, right? Yeah. Uh, M-I-N-E-R-S, not, not right. children, <laughs> and said that work hour restrictions on them was OK because this is right. mining, right? And which then, is dangerous work and very and, – and, and hazardous to your health and so forth. So of course the court recognized that the government has a, a legitimate role in protecting people against dangerous or dishonest business practices. But if it's just an ordinary trade, then, then, then people have the right to decide for themselves. Hmm. And another case that followed in those footsteps, one of my very favorite, is a case called Adkins versus Children's Hospital in the 1920s in which the court struck down a minimum wage law that applied only to women and that was located here in, D in District of Columbia. And uh, Now what's going to happen if you pass a minimum wage law that applies only to women? They're, they're not going to get any jobs. Yeah, all the jobs are going to go to men, which is why the male-dominated trades unions supported these kinds of laws. So Willie Lyons, who ran an elevator in a, in a Washington, D.C. hotel, liked her job earned less than the minimum wage, lost her job because of the minimum wage law. She sued and said, hey, I have the right to earn a living how I choose. The government doesn't have any right to come in and tell me that I, sh I can't be employed at the wage that I'm willing to accept. And it went up to the Supreme Court. It's a very interesting case. It was written by Justice George Sutherland who was an early act advocate of female suffrage. And he based his opinion on the 19th Amendment. He said, maybe there was a time when women were too weak or dumb or incapable of making economic decisions for themselves. But with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we've recognized women as equals and they have the same right as men do to earn a living and make those kinds of decisions for themselves. Let me ask a question about Lochner's legacy because when we talked about it here, when you described it, it was like this case was, yeah, they just did the right thing. The court struck down the silly law and we're good to go. But this, this case in – when I was in law school and when Trevor was in law school, you know, this case is perhaps second only to Korematsu, the case <laughs> yeah, right. making it OK to lock up Japanese people maybe during World War II. Maybe but it might be tied. Maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, as far as just being despised by law yeah. professors, they think that there's like almost nothing more evil than the Lochner decision, which is quite a different reaction to it than you just had. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what's going on what, there? What, what, before, before we uh, get the answer to that, I want to um, – uh, going back to the substance of the case, Aaron – when we were in law school together, had had a line about Lochner uh, that I think you said to your class, uh, and I use it when I talk about it now, which is I, I always say, you know, because you're always debating your classmates on this because they think it's so bad, and you say, you know, who really needs a maximum work hour week law? Lawyers. I mean, everything about lawyer, like like the dr drug abuse rates, the divorce rates, the health yeah. problems, right. working eight hours a week, and every time you tell lawyers that, they say, well, no, no, we we don't we don't need protection. But, right. but bakers, of course, do. Yeah, that's a good, and, very good point. That's and they, very and point. they hate Lochner so much, as he said. So how, why is the hatred well, so – what happened in the Lochner era? Yeah, Lochner became a, a lightning rod for progressives who wanted to argue for a radical reinterpretation of how constitutional liberty ought to work. Uh, they argued against the concept of natural rights. Rights are just permissions that the state gives to us instead. They argued against constitutionally limited government. Government ought to be op in the business of adjusting our lives so as to make them better in basically every conceivable dimension, making them more moral and just and happy and full. Uh, and courts really shouldn't be in the business of restricting democracy. The, democ the democratic process should basically have its way across the board and that the and, and that means that the courts should stand back and whether the constitution allows it or not, the constitution is a living document and so it should it changes to meet the changing needs of the day. Well Lochner stands obviously in opposition to all those things. It says that there are certain fundamental aspects of freedom that cannot be justly infringed by any legislature and when the legislature does infringe those rights, it's depriving us of liberty without due process of law and the courts ought to intervene. So Lochner became very clear for that. But really the reason why Lochner became such a symbol was Holmes's dissenting opinion. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes 
um, who said, all my life I have sneered at the natural rights of man. He really meant it. He did not believe that there was such a thing as justice. There was only force uh, and, and basically random personal tastes about what is just and not just. And so in his opinion, he argues that the idea of liberty – this is a quote – the idea of liberty is perverted when it is used to prevent the outcome of a dominant opinion. Now, it's hard for me to imagine what the word liberty could, <laughs> could otherwise mean other than to prevent the outcome of a dominant opinion. But um, Holmes – he viewed the, the, the democratic process as a process where people of, quote, fundamentally differing views, end quote, could hash out what is just and unjust um, and therefore, if the majority decides that bakers should work no more than 10 hours a day, it, it ain't nobody else's business if the democratic process restricts their freedom. And so he basically turned that opinion – which, by the way, his his dissenting opinion in, in in Lochner is a masterpiece of dishonesty and falsehood. There is basically not a word in it that is correct. My favorite in, in there is when he says that the a constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing views. That proposition flies in the face of every word of political philosophy written since Aristotle said. <laughs> you cannot have a constitution for people of fundamentally differing views. You have a constitution of people – among people of fundamentally shared views who might differ on the particulars but they agree on the fundamental precepts of, of justice and liberty but not for Holmes. So Holmes's opinion in that case became a manifesto for people who wanted the state to grow far beyond what the constitution previously had allowed in order to accomplish the goals of social justice as they called it, which is to say in order to restrict freedom to what the political elites thought was acceptable and appropriate. And so Lochner became famous for that reason rather than what it actually held, which is a relatively minor uh, and rather routine opinion. And in fact, not even really symbolic of a, a, a consistent laissez-faire ideology on the court. As David Bernstein has pointed out in his book, the courts at that time actually supported a large number of restrictions on economic liberty, particularly restrictions on the rights of women, yeah. which well, were overturned in the 1920s. Mueller versus Atkins Oregon. Case. Yeah. Just 1908, three years after it, they, they unanimously, if I think, uh, upheld uh, work hours law for, for women in Mueller right. versus Oregon. So it's, it's almost, it was almost the exact same court. So yeah. the, everything about the Lochner era is – Highly overblown. They were just the idea that they just struck down good social legislation left and right. I mean, some of the stuff they were striking down was, as Tim said, minimum wage hours just for women. And you often hear it said that the, during the Lochner era, the court protected economic liberty out of a, uh, an economic ideology. Well, when you read those opinions, there's not a word of economics in there. I, I did the search. There, there's maybe one reference to Adam Smith in one of these opinions. But these cases are not about economic liberty. Justice Sutherland never – I mean about economic ideology. There's not a word in Justice Sutherland's opinion in Adkins, for instance, about – economics or supply and demand or anything like that, even though he could very well have made a good argument on those points. Instead, it's all about freedom and the freedom of freedom of choice. These are moral and political philosophical points. That's what it was about. It's about the liberties of the Declaration of Independence, not about supply and demand curves or anything like that. And when we get up to the New Deal and the the, the end of the Lochner era, because we the story gets into the point of how do we get economic liberty to be so Disrespected, yeah. and, you know, and now we get to New Deal. What happened there that that put them on the back burner? And, well, and why but, do you think that is? That's the other thing too. I mean, that's a different question. Why is it that economic liberty is disrespected, and what happened? To well, the New Deal way? era was the triumph of this political revolution that began slightly before the Lochner opinion was issued. So the Progressive Era, I think I would probably date the beginning of the Progressive Era to the publication of Edward Bellamy's book, Looking Backward, 1887, that, which was the novel that introduced the phrase um, uh, cradle to grave. And it was incredibly popular, by the way. There were Bellamy clubs in every state in the, in the country and it was a hugely popular novel. Um, Anyway, the progressive movement was was reaching its adolescence at the time Lochner was decided and it became sort of the target of everything they were against and progressive ideology f boiled and, and new ideas were being f f fostered and so forth until 1934 in Nebbia versus New York when the Supreme Court uh, created the concept of rational basis scrutiny and you had the, the, the long sleep of economic liberty as a constitutional right. What you talk about rational basis scrutiny, which is part of this 
there's these different levels of scrutiny that the court uses – the courts use to evaluate right. laws. Can you tell us what those are before we go into the specifics of the new sure. rational basis? So these are the tests that courts use to determine whether a law violates the constitution or not. They ask these, these questions about that law. In a case involving strict scrutiny, the court will say, is this law narrowly tailored to advance a compelling government interest? Now that's basically just a bunch of, of <laughs> phraseology. What it really means is the law has to be designed in such a way as to accomplish something really important and not do anything else um, if it's to satisfy this strict scrutiny standard. So no false positives and no false negatives. Um, it has to do something crucial and do it well. A law that is subject to rational basis scrutiny on the other hand, in order to pass – constitutional muster, such a law only has to be rationally related to a legitimate government interest. Again, we don't really know what that means. The court itself acknowledged in the 1987 opinion, our cases have not laid out the standards for determining what constitutes a legitimate government interest. So we don't even really know what it means. But it basically means if somebody might have thought it was a good idea, then it's OK. That's what the rational basis test means. It always struck me when we have these, these sliding scales of scrutiny that they seem weird in light of the language of the constitution. Aaron Yes, they do. Aaron Trevor Because we don't – the constitution doesn't say this Congress really shall make – Trevor Burrus Yeah, like yeah. Congress shall make no law right. unless it's got a compelling reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, says, it says no, period. Yeah. And so how did we even get to strict scrutiny, much less rational basis? Trevor Yeah. Well, it, the strict scrutiny standard comes from the Korematsu case you mentioned before about the Japanese internment camps. And what the court said was, well, when a, when a law restricts the rights of a, of a particular minority group that might be disenfranchised, we're going to be really skeptical about that law. We're not, we're, it makes us really uncomfortable and we'll only allow it in really rare circumstances. You're right. The constitution doesn't say constitutional violations are allowed in rare circumstances. In fact, um, 1934, the same, case, same year as Nebbia, there was another case called Home Loan Association versus Blaisdell. And in that case, the court struck – basically invalidated another important provision of the constitution, the contracts clause. And in a, a dissenting opinion, the court – the justices said – in fact, it was Justice, Justice Sutherland, Sutherland yeah. the same one I mentioned It's before. a great opinion. Yeah. He said if we don't uphold the constitution when it pinches as well as when it comforts, then we might as well throw it away. <laughs> right. Well, I, yeah, and I think that the, the way I describe scrutiny um, is often – you always have to evaluate something about what you're trying to do. You can't just be like – and whether or not it's accomplishing your goals. And the question is almost like strict scrutiny says you have to use a, a scalpel right, to do something. Yeah. You have to approach it with a scalpel and say I'm just going to – I need to take out this thing from this guy and I can only take out this thing. Rational basis says, oh, you can use a sledgehammer. You right. can just You can just – Hit the guy right across the chest and try what you do. And if you hurt all the other organs, it doesn't really matter because yeah. it's not a very important right. And as I've said, it's uh, the the whole question is confused by the fact that the court has never told us what it means, what a legitimate government interest is. There's been a few cases where they've said some things aren't legitimate government interests, but they've never told us what how we even decide what a legitimate government interest is. So it's really, in many ways, a shell game. The entire st uh, uh, st tiers of scrutiny. Uh, requirement. But what it, what it means in practice is that if you're going to prove that a law violates the rational basis test, which is the test that the courts – because of the Nebbia case, that's the test that the courts apply to economic liberty. If you're going to, to win that case, you're going to prove that the law is irrational. You have to disprove every conceivable basis for the law, which of course is completely impossible. Not only is it impossible to prove a negative, but it's certainly impossible to prove an infinite series of possible negatives. <laughs> but that is what a plaintiff has to do to win such a case. So it, what happened in Nebbia was the court upheld a law that said you weren't allowed to sell milk for less than eight cents a quart. This, of course, was during the, the depths of the, new, of, the, of the Great Depression. Unemployment was 25 percent and the government says, well, here's our solution. We're going to make it illegal for poor mothers to buy cheap milk to feed to their babies. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's OK because if the government wants to regulate the economy, they can do basically anything they want. And that's the, the law that we live under today. If it comes to certain kinds of preferred rights, the freedom of speech and stuff, strict scrutiny applies. But these freedoms like economic liberty or private property rights is, are subject to this anything goes rational basis standard thanks to the 1934 Nebbia case. So when you're not writing books and appearing on excellent podcasts, <laughs> you're litigating these kinds of cases. And so are, are there – have you won 
against a rational basis? Have I'm, you had I, laws struck down under rational I'm basis? I'm glad tests? to say yes. Um, I've won. I've won cases under the rational basis test, and it ain't easy. Um, I not long ago had a judge come out, and before I started to argue, she said, "Before you start, I just want you to know you have filed more paper in this case than any case I have ever presided over, including patent cases." <laughs> so yes, it is not an easy job to to overcome the rational basis test. Um, in February of this year, I've won a case in Kentucky challenging that state's law that restricted the moving industry. You're not allowed to run a moving company in Kentucky until you first get permission from all of these states' existing moving companies. And this is a, a law called the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity Law, which unfortunately is on the books of most states in one form or another. It applies to everything from moving companies and taxi companies to even hospitals have to get permission from other hospitals before they're allowed to open up. And so in order to win those cases, what I had to do was I had to get evidence about every single application for a moving license in the past five years and what had happened to, in all of those cases and show to the judge that every time a person had applied for a license and an existing company had objected, that person was denied a license and that the, the, the state had even rejected – uh, applications from a guy – for one guy who had been in the moving business for 35 years before he decided to start his own company. He was denied in a written opinion that said, you're fully qualified but we just don't want more moving companies, so denied. Well, that clearly deprives my client, Raleigh Bruner, a small business owner in Lexington, Kentucky, of his right to earn a living without unreasonable government interference. He's perfectly qualified. The government has no business depriving him of his freedom and I'm glad to say we won that case in February of this year. Can you talk a little bit uh, – going back a, a little bit on – Litigating for liberty in, in that sense, what, what Pacific Legal Foundation is like, how how you work, how you find cases, what your strategy is going for, going forward to try and bring those cases, just in general for people who aren't maybe familiar with the strategy sure. here. Well, there are there are lots of groups out there that litigate to accomplish constitutional goals. Um, the most famous, of course, is the ACLU. Well, in 1973, um, then California Governor Ronald Reagan said, you know, there ought to be a group out there that does this sort of thing for those of us who believe in free markets and individual liberty. And so that year, Pacific Legal Foundation was founded by three of his staff members and um, and within, over the course of the next few years, several other similar organizations were founded across the country. There was um, – there's Washington Legal Foundation, Mountain States Legal Foundation, various other foundations like that in um, – in the 1990s, of course, there was sort of a second generation of these groups that was founded including the Institute for Justice and uh, various organizations that focus only on – in a particular state or only on a particular issue. Um, a lot of state-based think, tank, think tanks like the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix and other organizations have lawyers who litigate cases for freedom in their state courts. So it has become really a, um, a massive and important part of the liberty movement in this country that, that we have in addition to the policy organizations, we have these litigation groups. And what, what PLF does is we have three main areas of focus, um, private property rights. We, we litigate not only um, cases involving like eminent domain but regulatory takings when the government prohibits you from using your property as, as you want to and therefore deprives you of the value of your property. Um, we won a very famous case in 1987 called Nolan versus California Coastal Commission, which really laid the groundwork for a lot of these cases. Um, we, our second area of focus is environmental law. We uh, litigate a lot of Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act cases, things like that. In fact, just this last month, we won a decision in a federal court in Utah that struck down the listing of the Utah prairie dog on the endangered species list. Now, the Utah prairie dog exists only within one state and has absolutely no economic value. Nobody uses prairie dog pelts to make coats. Nobody eats prairie dog. Nobody does anything with prairie dogs. They have no economic value at all. Um, and the district court judge held that because Congress cannot show that there's any effect on interstate commerce for the prairie dog, that it had no authority to list the prairie dog on the endangered species list. That is the first case that has ever struck down the listing of a species on the endangered species list. And that's for in, that's in because that came up in uh, the nineties with the uh, what was it the cave spiders at the oh cave? yeah there was the, the cave bat, bugs um, there was the case of uh, yeah there's various cases of of species that exist only within one area the delta smelt is one that's been a big issue in California it only exists in, in the delta area of California has no economic value and Congress only has power to regulate commerce among the several states and with foreign nations and with the Indian tribes. And yet it claims to be able to control what anything that affects these species that have no interstate character and no commercial value. Anyway, so we do those environmental cases. 
and then we invo- are involved in cases about race, race preferences, um, affirmative action programs and um, – which violate not only the 14th Amendment but many state laws. California, for example, has a constitutional prohibition on race preferences and we are the only organization that enforces that. Um, the state attorney general – has consistently refused to enforce that provision of the state constitution since it was enacted in 1996 and we're the only organization that does so. Um, then we have certain uh, smaller projects including my economic liberty project where uh, – which is designed to protect the rights of business owners and entrepreneurs against these stupid kinds of occupational licensing laws and so forth. Um, and we have won important cases in, in various states trying to, to – put some teeth back into this central aspect of constitutional liberty, the right to use your skills and your knowledge to provide for yourself and your family. And how do you find your clients? Well, it's not easy. That in fact that is probably the hardest part of the job is finding clients because you know a lot of the time business owners are afraid to, to take on the, the the powers that be, and understandably so, because you know the, their their livelihoods are at risk. A lot of the time they don't have the resources to 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 do it, which is why we represent people free of charge. But even so, it's you know the courts are, system can be very slow and it can take a long time. Um, you know, and for, to ask a person who wants to start a small business to wait for a year, two years for a court opinion can be a hard thing to do. The upside to it is once we win those cases, it sets precedent that protects entrepreneurs for generations into the future. So it's very rewarding. But it is very hard to find cases. People call us or we search them out through you know the the news stories and so forth. And you're looking for a specific type. He said uh, a, a plaintiff who is willing to take it all the way, who wants to litigate for principle, who's probably pretty sympathetic, probably yeah. helps. Is, right. is not Donald Trump. It's <laughs> gra- right. grandma. On the that, street, although right? that is true, I do want to emphasize we we always make it a point to say that although we do defend the rights of businesses and entrepreneurs who off, who don't have the resources to protect their own economic liberty. The right of a rich person to earn a living and to keep the fruits of his labor is every bit as value, valuable and as important as the right of any poor person or starting out entrepreneur. Um, rich people and poor people alike have the right to the fruits of their labor and the government has no right to discriminate against people based on how much they earn or how hard they work um, in, in protecting some people's rights and then turning their backs on the rights of big businesses. That's, that's wrong also. And as a litigator, fighting against these are basically – in the economic liberty context, just beating your head against the rational basis test all the time yeah. and deposing government bureaucrats and asking them why did you do this and they just say – do you have a favorite answer of oh. why a government bureaucrat told you that they were doing oh, yeah. something because you say, why are you regulating my, interior my, decorators? The, my favorite – I did a case um, – Gosh, almost 10 years ago now um, in which my client ran a business, uh, a pest control business. He didn't use pesticides and he didn't deal with insects. He put spikes on buildings to keep pigeons from landing on them and put screens to keep squirrels out and things like that. Structural pest control, that's called. Well, in California, you have to get a license, a branch two structural pest control operator's license. I'm sure you know way too much about the, indeed. <laughs> the regulations in California. In, indeed, I have read the examination and I'm under a court order not to tell you what's on that examination. But uh, <laughs> I, I can't, yeah, uh, that's you have to pass a 200 question multiple choice exam to get a branch two license. And here's an interesting bit: there's not a single question on there about pigeons, and not a single question on there about spikes. And it got better because the law only applied if you were dealing with pigeons. It specifically said if you dealt with any other kind, if you put the same spikes on the same building to keep seagulls away, you didn't need any license at so all. So your, your mental state really mattered. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we, in fact, in one of the depositions, we asked. How do you know whether the spikes are put on the building to keep pigeons away and, or not other kinds of animals? And he said, well, we investigate. I said, do you, did you, do you ask the person who puts the spikes on the building? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, no, my favorite part of that deposition was we, we deposed the state, state's expert witness who was an expert on pest control work. And I said to him, now this law requires two years of training to put spikes on a building to keep pigeons away. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, but no training at all to put the same spikes in the same building to keep seagulls away. He said, yes, that's right. I said, would you call this irrational? He said, yes, I would. And the government's lawyer says, uh, can we take a break? <laughs> <laughs> he just admitted it right there. Comes back from the break. He says, he says I'd like to clarify what I said about irrational. <laughs> And uh, he said, what I meant to say was it might seem irrational, but here's what happened. Originally, you needed a license for all pest control work. And then we said, well, some people were saying, well, if you're not using pesticides, you're not a threat to the public. So why should you have to get a license? So they were going to get rid of the licensing requirement. And those of us who already had licenses, we didn't want to face competition against people like your client. And so we said, well, why don't you divide up the market and we can keep the pigeons, the rats, and the mice because they're the most common pests. And uh, those other people can deal with all the other ones. <laughs> and I'm like – 
Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> so just pure protectionism. Yeah. yeah. So we went to the court and we said to the judge, Your Honor, it's an undisputed fact in this case that this law is irrational. And we lost because of the rational basis test. What the judge said was, I'm allowed under the rational basis test to make up my own justification for the law, which is true. And he said, and my justification is, well, maybe you'd show up for a pigeon job and pesticides have been applied to the building by somebody else. And so you would need to know about pesticides. Well, OK, but you could show up to work on a bat problem and you didn't need any license at all. Right? So that didn't work. So we appealed that case to the Ninth Circuit and I'm glad to say we won at the Ninth Circuit. The Court of Appeals struck that law down and it said that the rational basis test is violated by a law that is contrary to itself, that is – that it, it, where a law says, well, we're doing one thing but we're going to provide all these exemptions for it that undermine the purpose of the law itself. Now, that might seem a pretty obvious proposition to you. It certainly seems like an obvious proposition to non-lawyers that a law that contradicts itself is not rational. <laughs> and yet I, I'm sorry to say that is one of the few court opinions that has ever explained what the rational basis test means, that there is a category of things that violate the test and that is laws that are self-contradictory. That was the first case to say that. That's really remarkable. That shows you how murky it is to litigate under the rational basis test. My friend Clark Neely says there really is no such thing as the rational basis test. There's judging or not judging and, and the, the judge can decide whether to judge the case or not to judge. Yeah, we had him as a guest and yeah. The, the yeah oh, yeah. It's a great podcast and, and he's right that it's, a, it's like litigating in the twilight zone. It's like punching underwater. Right? So far, the cases that you've discussed that you were involved in have been victories. You, you've told us about cases that you've won. Those are the ones which, I prefer to remember. Right, yes, but, but I, I fear that that may give our listeners a potentially more of a sense of hope about yeah, this than there actually true. is, that things, are, that things are better than they actually are. And so I'm wondering if you could give us those less fun to talk about examples of just – Shocking. Really shocking and ridiculous yeah. losses. Well, the 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 most the most egregious one is the one I mentioned um, about Louisiana, the florist law. So the florist licensing requirement was challenged in a case in 2005, and the judge said that the law was constitutional and passed the rational basis test. I, I want to emphasize, I'm not making this up. The judge said it was constitutional because it protected the public from scratching their fingers on the wires that florists use to hold their floral arrangements together. In order to, to get a license, you would be trained in how to use the wires and therefore you would be less likely to harm the consumer. Now, of course, there was no evidence at all that anybody had ever been scratched by a wire or had been harmed by being scratched by a wire or that it was dangerous. No evidence in the record at all. But the judge said that he could imagine such a circumstance and therefore it was constitutional. And unfortunately, that precedent remains on the books. When a judge writes an opinion like that, it's hard to believe in the sense that like you have to think he's either an idiot and most judges probably are not idiots right. or he's corrupt. But like or, I, or he doesn't care about economic or he doesn't care but even still like he would there just seems to be – like is he lying through yeah, his no, teeth? I, like I know what's what the motivation at. here? So every action intends some good and the reason why the judge does that is because he's the victim of a bad ideology and that bad ideology is progressivism. They, the judge writes – writing that opinion is embarrassed by it, knows how stupid it is but convinces himself that he's doing a better job because he believes in the virtue of judicial restraint. So the nonsense concept of judicial restraint – which is the idea that if the government wants to violate your rights, courts should do nothing about it, has been endorsed and embraced as if it were a positive good by a large number of conservative particularly uh, but also liberal um, advocates and, and law professors and judges. And so they have persuaded themselves that by showing restraint – that's the that's term for restraint. If you call your dereliction of duty restraint – now it sounds like a positive virtue and so the judge persuades himself, well, I know this opinion is bad but it's for a higher good. That higher good is judicial restraint. I'm not interfering with the democratic process which of course is exactly the excuse that judges who issued decisions like Korematsu tell themselves. Well, I'm not going to interfere to protect the Japanese Americans from unjust inter internment but it's for, the, it's, for the better, it's for the greater good. I also think it's important to note that – if you look at the hierarchy of rights, the kind of rights that get super strict scrutiny, high protection such as free speech and then the ones that don't such as economic liberty, they kind of mirror the rights that judges themselves Very true. like. Very they true. probably haven't started a business. They probably never 
really felt themselves tied to their economic life, yep. like being an entrepreneur. And the We've way made this point to their, before to with words. a lot of modern like political philosophers, the same sort of thing. You read Rawls and he talks about the kinds of rights that are super important and they're all the kinds of rights that are super important for being a professor at Harvard. Yeah. Aristotle said that the ideal life is philosophy the, and the, the Winhams made their god a horse. And in the same way, if, if courts were presided over by carpenters, there would be a lot of very well thought out, very <laughs> careful judicial opinions about carpentry. And there would be some and, – and then – and the judges at that time would then say, yeah, but lawyers, they, you can regulate them however you want. We're going to look the other way. We don't care. And that's what you would get. I think judges who, who pay attention to these issues um, – let me say, I think – that there are lots of judges out there who know how bad the situation is with rational basis tests, the rational basis test, but there's nothing they can do about it because it's the controlling precedent. Now, there is something they can do about it. They can at least write separate opinions that say, I'm forced to do this, even though I think it's wrong because the law is so bad. That's what Judge Janice Brown did not long ago in a case that I worked on called Hedinga. That was a case in which um, dairy regulations in this country are completely irrational. It's always milk, Debbie milk, yeah, Caroline really. products milk. That's very yeah, true. We kind of bitch that, that, and then yes, milk again. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the Hedinga case, the, Mr. Hedinga had found that the law just the, the dairy regulations just didn't ha happen to not apply to his dairy operations, and so the, he was able to charge less than the minimum required by federal law for most other dairies. So the, the dairy, dairies didn't like that, so they got a law passed to single him out and shut him down, and so he sued and challenged that. And his case was dismissed because the judge said, "I can imagine a rationale for the law, therefore I won't even listen to the evidence." And Judge Janice Brown upheld the dismissal. But very reluctantly, I wrote a wonderful separate opinion in that case saying this rational basis test, just all it is is blinding the judge to the kinds of shenanigans that we would never tolerate if this were religious freedom or freedom of speech. We would never – for example – I mean she doesn't use this example but we would never say that – the Catholics can say there's not allowed to be another Protestant church unless we give them permission. And yet we have a law that says you can't run a moving company until another until all the other moving companies say it's okay. The only reason is is that the law has decided to treat religious freedom with more seriousness than economic freedom despite economic liberties long pedigree and central role in the lives of, of all individuals. I think also it's worth mentioning that when we try to get the heading a case to the Supreme Court uh, what, in the brief that you wrote, what was the, the question that we asked the Supreme Court to review? How absolutely minor that court! We weren't even yeah. asking them to overturn the rational basis test. Right? If you could explain. All that, we but. asked in that court, in that case, was we asked the court to say that we're allowed to introduce evidence before That's it. they rule. Yeah. The rational basis test, as I mentioned, said that the government that the the law will be upheld as constitutional as it, if, if there's any rational conception that might have concluded it was a good idea. Well, you ought to be able to introduce evidence that that, that is not the case. You, you know, if I'm required, which I am, to disprove every possible basis for the law in order to win a rational basis case, I ought to be allowed to introduce that evidence. And what the Hedinga court did was it dismissed the case prior to fact finding without receiving any evidence because the judge said, I can imagine a rationale for the law. And unfortunately, the courts are kind of in disarray on this issue about whether they are required to allow a plaintiff in a rational basis case to even introduce evidence at all. And I, in fact, just last month, I published a law review article about this in the George Mason Civil Rights Law Journal about the, the relationship between the motion to dismiss and the rational basis test. And it really is something that remains unsettled and it shouldn't because – Almost with, within the – in fact, the same year that the rational basis test was invented in 1934, the Supreme Court said it is only an evidentiary presumption. You're allowed to introduce evidence to overcome it. It is not a complete barrier to all constitutional challenge. But courts today often treat it as a complete barrier to all constitutional challenge and they say you're not allowed to – you can't win this case unless you disprove the rationality of this law and we're not, we're not going to allow you to introduce evidence to disprove the rationality of this law. So it seems uh... – Kind of dismal in the, in the economic liberty front, litigating for liberty. But but what do we see coming next? Do we do we have any reason to be optimistic? Is there anything coming down that that may fix this abysmal situation? Yeah, no. I honestly, I, I really am actually quite optimistic in the long run. In the short run, I think things are going to get worse before they get better. But I'm I'm convinced things are getting better. Um, 
law students today are far more skeptical of the New Deal era cases than their predecessors were and uh, take much more seriously the idea of economic liberty. We've seen scholarship by people like, like uh, David Bernstein, Randy Barnett, David Mayer on economic liberty in the constitution and you. That, that didn't exist before uh, and we've seen these cases that have really established at least the beginning of a real, I think, revival of judicial respect for economic liberty. It's slow. It's gradual. But of course, it was gradual for the progressives. It took them 50 years. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. And there is, a, there is something on the horizon that eventually will have to come to the Supreme Court and that's there's a circuit split on this question of whether mere economic protectionism is a legitimate interest under the 14th Amendment. So the Sixth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit have all said that the government may not use its licensing laws simply to pro prohibit economic competition for the purpose of benefiting some chosen favorites. Meanwhile, the Tenth Circuit has said just the opposite in a case called Powers versus Harris which was 10 years ago now, more than that I think, the court said, yes, the government may use its licensing laws to prohibit competition simply because it wants to, even if there is no connection at all to protecting public safety or health or anything like that. And that circuit split, the Supreme Court has been asked to take it on at least two occasions I believe and, uh, and they have declined to do so so far. Well, eventually they're going to have to resolve that question. And when they do, I think the scholarship and the judicial precedent is there to show that economic liberty is a central component of what we conceive of as liberty. The phrase that lawyers often use is they say that the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment is freedom that is deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. Well, it's hard to imagine a right more deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition than economic independence, economic freedom. That's why we call it the American dream. So I am convinced that the coming generation of lawyers, judges and law professors is going to restore real meaning to economic liberty as a constitutional right. And that's why I am I'm very optimistic about the right to earn a living. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.